Hello. Today we're joined by R. Rex Paris, a renowned trial lawyer of the Paris Law Firm in Lancaster, California. Rex has obtained some of the record-setting verdicts throughout the state recently this year. He's obtained one verdict for $45 million for an injured uh, paraplegic and another verdict of over $50 million for two brothers injured in a, in a large truck accident. So Rex, welcome. Glad to have you here today. Good morning. How are you? We're doing okay. So first, Rex, why don't you just tell us a little about your background, how you got into being a trial lawyer, because I know people will be interested in hearing your story. Well, I don't know how far back you want to go. You want to go to the time they sentenced me to jail? Let's start there. That's a good start. So I was 19, and, and uh, I had a bunch of traffic tickets I didn't bother to appear on. And so they, sent, they sentenced me to go to the county jail for a while. Well, when you're 19, that's a very frightening, frightening uh, time. And we'll make a long story short, I didn't actually have to go to jail, but I decided then I was going to stand on the other side of that bar rather than the defendant's side. And that's really the motivation behind it. Prior to that, I didn't even have a high school education. And then you went back, to, you got your high school diploma, you went to college. Well, I never did get the high school diploma, but I tested pretty well, so I was able to go to college. And then you uh, went to Southwestern Law School, and once you got out, when you became a lawyer, what kind of practice were you in? I was an insurance defense lawyer for about five years, and then my wife and I, I I'm from Lancaster, she was from the Bay Area, we moved back to Lancaster. And the two of us, she, you know, she was the secretary and I was the lawyer and we opened an office. Now there's 20 some lawyers. And what, how would you say that experience as a defense lawyer helped shape you as a plaintiff trial lawyer? Well, there was a lot of reasons why that was beneficial. One of them, every time I took a plaintiff's deposition, I asked him, how'd you find your lawyer? Uh, so I, I was learning how to get cases. But, you know, obviously, if you know how the defense thinks and how, how the procedures of an insurance company in relationship to the insurance defense lawyer, uh, it, it gives you a, a leg up, I think. Now, tell us a little bit about your firm. I know you work with your wife, your two sons, your brother. What's the firm do? What do you specialize? We do class actions and personal injury. And every now and then we'll do something that just interests us. You know, like I did the, uh, I've been doing uh, voter rights cases, California voter rights actions uh, up and down the state, mainly because it just interests me. We well, also have been involved in fracking and, and things in well, the that's environment. That's right, I forgot about that. We were the first law firm that started dealing with the, uh, the water contamination in the San Joaquin Valley from the oil industry. Uh, we filed all kinds of lawsuits from that, which in, which put us in a position that when Porter Ranch blew, uh, we were we were right there. We knew a lot about injection and, and the law and, and the ramifications, of it. and so it was good timing. Most most things in life, it's just a question of timing. I want to ask you some questions about being a trial lawyer. How important is it to focus on your personality, your character as a trial? Lawyer? Well, obviously. You know, years ago, I, I did a Franklin Covey week-long seminar, and I'll never forget they had this, this uh, video of a guy, and he was talking about, you really can't wear two hats. You know, you can't be a nice guy at home and an asshole at work. You, it, it doesn't work. You, you're, either, you're either a decent human being or you're not. And being a decent human being, I don't think, is anything you're born with. I, I think those are skills you develop. You know, are you interested in other people? Are you concerned about their welfare and their well-being? And if you're not, what do you got to do to get there? And being able to put yourself in the shoes of other people, I think, is critically important. One thing that I, I noticed that you're always uh, sending me books or telling me about new books you read, what are the areas that you're interested in? How do you use that to help your abilities as a trial lawyer? Well, you know, I'm one of those people who believe that we don't have just a biological process that occurs in our brain. And the more we understand that biological process of decision making, the more we can influence those decisions. And so for the last 20 years, I, I spend every day reading for some period of time, some maybe 15 minutes, maybe three hours. I'm always reading cognitive science and how we can use that to, to persuade people. And again, it's perfect timing. You know, we're in a renaissance of cognitive science now. And for trial lawyers, I think that's critically important. I, I agree, and I'm fascinated by the subject. Give us some examples of some books you've read and how that's helped shape the way you do things. 
Well, you know, uh, Pinker's Stuff of Thought is a good place to start. Uh, Kenneman's work is uh, you know, Thinking Fast and Slow. I think everybody should read that. The, uh, you know, and if you want to get more advanced, there's Robert Sapolsky's work out of Stanford. He's a primate bi neurobiologist, and uh, the, it, he just wrote a book called Behave, uh, Humans at Their Best and Their Worst, with the whole idea that you know, decisions that are made probably start three days before you make them. Uh, and, you know, reasons I enjoyed trying a case with you is your recognition that it's what's going to happen down the road in the case, not what's happening at the moment. And I don't know if you know you do this, but you are constantly doing that. You, the, the way you deal with the judge is very much like a sports player, you know, a, a, a football coach deals with the referee is you're not worried about the call that's already been made because you're not going to affect that at all. It's the next call, and you don't make it comfortable for them when they make bad calls. That, that, was, that was a joy to watch. I'd never quite seen that before. Uh, well, that was a unique I, situation with the personalities involved. But in this cognitive science, how can lawyers use cognitive science to help improve their persuasion, their pers uh, ability to persuade the trier back to the jury. Well, you know, one of the books that I think everybody should read is uh, Start with the Why, and it's by Simon Sinek. And it, re puts, it turns on its head everything we've been taught about how to structure an argument, and meaning that he gives great examples from various uh, different things that have occurred where you first tell people why it's important. And once they buy into why it's important, then you tell them the how and then the what. And what we tend to do is we'll start with the what, you know, we'll start with so-and-so ran the stop sign and, you know, and then go through with the story. But if we st instead start with what are the rules and why are those rules important, the, uh, it, it's just starting with the why. The, another book is in the line of fire, which is, teaches you how to answer a question, you know, they've actually studied and watched and, and came up with what is the difference between a person that answers a question and then persuades somebody versus somebody who tries to persuade without answering the question. And they used presidential debates as an example, but we saw it in the Porter Ranch case. Remember the first hearing, the judge says to the defendant, can you articulate a defense to the nuisance cause of action? And what does he do? He goes, blah, 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 blah. And the judge goes, let me ask it again. Maybe you didn't hear me. Can you articulate a defense? Blah, 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 blah. And he goes, I'm going to give it one last shot and asks it again. And again, he doesn't answer it. Where I, and I think that's affected the way the judge views him for the last two years. Whereas if he had simply said, I can't answer it now, I can get back to you with it rather than try to bullshit him. And what I see lawyers do all the time is just not answer the question. I, I don't care what the answer is. Understand the question and then answer it. And then they're really open to the spin. They're really open to your persuasion, trying to persuade them. I, I totally agree with you. I hear lawyers, even that are working with me, I'm in court and the judge asks a question and they don't answer the question. And they dance around and if I was a judge, I'd be getting very frustrated. And as a lawyer, isn't it important and what's your views on that as you deal with the judge and your credibility and what you say and do, how does that affect your ability in the courtroom? Well, I, I, I'm a firm believer that you concede any point. There is no point that you shouldn't concede if it's going to affect your credibility, if it's going to destroy your credibility. Uh, and I see lawyers throw away their credibility all the time. And, and for what purpose? You know, and it comes back to bite them. You know, one, one time you told me in, a, in that trial we did, is look, you know, it takes a couple of weeks for the jury to trust you. you know? It takes a little while. And it's that the sight is on the, on the end of the case. It shouldn't be on what's right in front of you. Lawyers that are just looking at what's in front of you are the ones most likely to, to be dishonest with the court, which is death. I couldn't agree more. Let's talk more about this research data these cognitive science. If you were talking to young lawyers, what things should they do to uh, improve their abilities in court and to help their clients? Well, if we're talking about in, a, in front of a jury, it's a recognition. It's a thing called uh, horizontal segmentation, meaning we, we take the jury we, we were given 
and how well we can segment that jury and know what parts of the case are going to appeal to the individuals, the, I think the more vitally important that is. I, I think the more data we develop on that, you know, it's pretty easy to find out if a person's conservative or liberal. You can ask a few scratch questions and you'll know the answer to that. But if we started accumulating that data uh, and then comparing it to the different types of results we get, the, the, it's going to be difficult because we got to rely on the lawyer's uh, qualitative analysis rather than quantitative. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that should, should prevent us from gathering that data because I think it'll wash out if we get enough of it, you know, the, uh, just the statistical analysis of it. But I, I have found some of my best verdicts from very conservative jurors. Uh, what was it that, that drove conservatives to give a lot of money? Rules. Violation of rules. And, and then once you really establish how, how bad the violation of the rule is, then they'll punish them. I mean, we could talk about it not being punitive all day long, but it really is. The more liberal the person, the more you can tug at their heartstrings. But, you know, Robert Sapolsky came up with what he was telling me. He says he doesn't understand why lawyers spend so much time trying to get empathetic jurors. He goes, because empathetic people, you know, they're the kind of people that will stand around and not call 911. You know, they don't execute. They feel your pain really well, but they don't execute. Where... You know, I find, you know, sometimes what I'll do with jurors that are real conservative is I'll, one time we were talking about the death penalty, and I don't know how that ended up in Boy Dyer in a civil case, but I asked this one woman, can you pull the trigger? And she looks at me and smiles and go, I can pull the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really how I presented the case, was having the courage to make these people accountable. Conservatives are all about accountability, and if somebody violated the rules, then you've got to give them an argument but that where they can add the numbers up. And that, that's where you do that very effectively by, by dividing it up into so many constituent parts. The, uh, they know how to add. But if you, if you throw tugging at their heartstrings, you lose credibility with them. So it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a wire you've got to walk. You know, I was thinking about that. And, you know, people were always so, as plaintiff lawyers, banking on sympathy. I don't believe sympathy helps. I think it can hurt if you overplay your hand. What are your thoughts about that? There is no research out there confirming that sympathy motivates anybody. It just simply doesn't. Uh, and it'll have the negative effect on people who are suspicious of trial lawyer. You know? I just stay away from it. it, it it's too dangerous to, to toy with. All right. So let, let's talk about the future. You know, what, are, what about this cognitive research you've been doing, the data you've been reviewing? How do you see that helping you and others in the future? Well, I think it's going to help for the short run, but I also think it's going to make the system uh, unsustainable. I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, the way the system's structured now, I mean, let's face it, you, you got 12 people writing a check on somebody else's checking account. You know, it, it, that's what we do. The, uh, and I think once, you, once we learn more and more about the cognitive science and how people decide, if you have a liability case, there really is no limit to what you can get that jury to give you. And you know, now with the facial expression recognition stuff, hard, hardware they have now, you're able to structure your case and put your, your choreograph it so that the timing is just Im impeccably done to motivate the highest verdict. It, it, uh, there's a sustainability issue, I think. You bring up a great point here, this facial recognition software. What is your uh, familiarity with it, and can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, we bought in with a company called uh, Emotion, where we were, they licensed the, the software for us for jury trials. But then they sold it to Apple, so you know all, the, all our work and everything went away. But while we were doing it, we were able to tell which part of the case caused which emotions and actually be, we're able to uh, slice it up and demographics were most amenable to certain segments of the case. And then you were able to take it, if, you know, the people who were feeling angry at a certain point, what, were they, what did they do in regards to the verdict? And it was, it was amazing stuff we found out. You know, you want to put the anger in the center. You want the, you, you kind of want a happy jury when you send them into the jury room. The last thing you want is an angry jury when they go into the, because they'll fight with each other and they'll drive the verdict down. 
you know, uh, and then there's the simple stuff that, that we've learned from cognitive science, like anchoring, how anchoring works. Uh, it's not enough to, to know that if you put a high number up there, it'll pull them up. That, the anchoring effect is much more complex than that. You know, the, you also have to worry about the verdict being pulled down. That's why we usually waive medical bills, unless they're extraordinarily high, because it'll pull the verdict down for the non-economics. A lot of things like that become critically important that you really have to know inside out. You know, also, depending on what you're doing, whether or not you have eye contact with eye contact's a big deal. The, uh, Is that good I'm, or bad? Well, it's good if you adopt the right body postures and you're communicating with them. But if you're doing something angry, you're pointing your finger. Never point your finger at the jury. You, know? <laughs> you want to go to a third point to do that. When, when, years ago, I had this case, and I had a, had a jerk for a judge, I thought. I mean, really defense-oriented. But at the end of it, he just couldn't quit talking about what a great closing argument I did. But when we talked to the jury, they hated me. They hated my closing. They thought I was arrogant. They thought I was rude. What's the difference? The difference is the judge was looking at me from the side, and the jury was looking at me head on. That makes a critical difference. You know, I, I've learned that whenever I'm exhibiting certain emotions, not to be head on with them, to, you know, go to a third position, like point to the, the witness stand or something else. But that's an excellent point. I, I'm just fascinated by this story. How do you use it to determine what emotions are going to come on your case? Well, you have seven emotions that people can recognize, and you can train yourself. If you go to uh, Ekman's site, just 15 minutes a day, you'll be able to do the micro expression very, very quickly. But with the software, there's two other emotions that, that the software can determine. They can determine confusion and frustration, which are pretty critical when you're, you're a trial lawyer. And then what the software was able to do was get the, the chaining of different emotions. And, you know, like, did they first feel happy, then angry, then sad, or sad, and, you know, and what, did that create a difference in what the final result was? But this company, we were able to predict Trump's victory as far as the uh, Republican primary. Remember when he refused to say he wouldn't run as a third-party candidate? Everybody thought he killed himself. But the facial expression was joy. 87% of the people experienced joy when he was saying that. And then they started, you know, when the people who are angry tend to be louder, and that can pull the, the group with you. But that doesn't change how they felt when they heard it or how the viewers felt at home. Uh, and I suspect they were using that software in the election because they, they were doing things that were counterintuitive but were very effective. I have two more things I'd like to talk to you about. The, the first thing was you gave an example when I was in a trial with you and you drew a couple lines and you, you talked about a study. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I found that to be fascinating. Yeah, it's a famous study where, where you know, you, you have one subject and then everybody else in the group, like you'll have five or six people, uh, are in on, the, in on the study. And you have three lines, you know, two that are short and then one that's long, well, three lines, different lengths, uh, but one is substantially longer and one substantially shorter. And so then you tab the, the example, say, which, ma which of these lines match it? And it's the short one, but everybody in the group will point to the long one. And I mean, there's, there's no possible way you would think that the long one was the same length, right? It, it just doesn't, you know, A, B, and C. But an incredible number in the 70, upper 70 percentile of people uh, would point to the third one because that's what the group was pointing. And so when we, when we were in the closing argument and the rebuttal, I was pointing out to them that be careful of this phenomenon because what, what you'll find with juries is the person vocal will get them talking about, you know, this is the, long, this is the line that matches or this is the correct verdict. So what I suggested they do is, and this is the only way we know of counteracting that effect, and it's the conformity bias is what it's called. The only way we know of counteracting that is to have them write down their answer before they talk to the rest of the group. So I was encouraging them, write down what you think the right amount is before you, you talk to the group. Uh, 
And that'll give you something to anchor to as you talk to the group and avoid this conformity bias. Uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time to teach them that in a closing, but I think it's worth it. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I really enjoyed hearing that. Okay, my favorite topic, in addition to being a lawyer and a father and a grandfather and a reader, and you're the mayor of Lancaster. How many yeah. terms have you served as the mayor? Uh, well, it was initially two-year terms, and I did two, and then we changed it to four. But anyway, I've been mayor for 10 years, and I've had three terms. And what, what, what made you decide to want to run and be the mayor? Well, you know, I, I was born here in the community. Things were not going well. That, that was the primary reason. But there was a lot of reasons why I thought it would be beneficial as a lawyer, is we don't get to practice enough. You know, I mean, you're the only person I know who's in trial once a month. Uh, most people will do one trial a year if they're lucky. And, but it's the same skill set, you know, that, that we use in a courtroom that, we, that I use as mayor. And uh, so, you know, just the practice effect, I was looking forward to that. And, you know, as a mayor, you have to be able to go up to people you'd never met and start talking to them and develop a rapport quickly. What is jury selection but that? Uh, the, uh, the two just go together, same skill set. Are you enjoying it at your time as being the mayor, thinking you're making, uh, you're, you're, you're not doing it for the money, but you must be making a difference. The, you know, crime went down eight. The, went from 24 percent to four. We brought in all kinds of new factor. The uh, I, I think we've successfully have been dealing with a lot of challenges, and we're the first net zero city in the world. Meaning, you know, we've figured out a way to produce more electricity from the sun than we use, and we were the first city in the world to require all houses to be able to go off the grid and produce their own power and, and then save it in batteries. So, you know, it's really fulfilling. I, I, uh, and you enjoy it. Yeah. You know, the first, the first election cost me about $500,000 because I wouldn't take any campaign contribution. And people thought I was crazy, but I said, you know, I spent a lot more than that on my airplane and I have a lot more fun being mayor. <laughs> you know? All right. Listen, we've enjoyed it. We're going to do it again. But Rex, is a, you, thanks for all you do for all of us. And you're a great man and a great friend. And thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me.